This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Allison Cook, Tim, and Super Inframan. Thank you so, so very much. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight, my guest is Nathan Paul Isaac. How you doing, Nathan? I'm doing great, man. Uh, thanks for having me on the show tonight, you know? And I found out about you. Uh, Tim had talked to you. He has an upcoming episode with you. You have a podcast called Penny Royal. I do. I do indeed. It um, came out last, uh, it was October the 21st. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's been doing really well. You know, it's... Um, um, uh, it's it's uh, caused a lot of people to start messaging me about really strange things. So. <laughs> That's the best, though. I, I love getting people's other weird stories. I, I will say that's been one of the best things that um, some of them I've I haven't wanted to receive. Um, it's definitely brought out um, some you know some things you know you you open the door to this stuff and um, you know publicly. And then people start sending you some things that you're like, man, is this threatening? You know, is this, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, so some of those things have been unplugged, but honestly, overall the it's, it's been great, um, since we released it and, uh, yeah, I've, I've had some just like really, really crazy stories since man, I'm like, this is fantastic. You know, we'll have to add all this stuff to our, our research files. You know? Now, you know, you're releasing it in seasons. It's not saying you do like, like this show where it doesn't stop. Now, yeah, so so the originally, you know, when I when I started the project, um, I, I'd always wanted to do it as sort of a documentary about um, Somerset and sort of the strangeness that that I'd kind of found there. But um, and, and so I, I I'd always thought I was going to release it sort of like um, S Town, you know, with uh, you know, on on NPR um, where there was a set number of episodes and. Ah. Um, but and I always thought it was just going to be a one-off, right? Uh, but but it's definitely um, the amount of content that we found, and just sort of the way that it all played out. You know, originally it was just going to be um, my observations and sort of interviews with people um, about their weird experiences here, and then um, the, the deeper we got into it, the more that it, it that we sort of became part of the story, um, mm-hmm. and our experiences I think really were um, guiding the story, you know, in a weird way, um, um, which, uh, which I'm definitely, uh, which definitely we'll talk about. <laughs> yeah. 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 So w- have yeah. you always been interested in this stuff? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've, you know, I've researched, uh, 40 and stuff, uh, phenomena and I've always been in the paranormal since I was a kid, but, um, definitely I started, you know, in my early twenties, uh, to collect, a lot of stories, especially folklore. I, I grew up in Appalachia, um, in like deep Eastern Kentucky. And, um, there's just a rich history of folklore and strange stories there. And so, yeah. you know, that, that's, that's really where it started. And, and, um, but, you know, I, I left, uh, Eastern Kentucky, um, went to school at Transylvania university in, um, Lexington, um, you know, which is really in the center, you know, the bluegrass area, of uh, horses and bourbon, and uh, I never really thought I would go back to a small town. And and Somerset's not a small town by any means, um, but it's not a big city. And um, and then we ended up here, and and so the, so I did, you know, I continued my sort of collection of folklore um, here. And uh, yeah, I've just I've just always been interested in strange stories. You know, I, I love it. I love collecting just stories in general. My, I love stories so much that my, that I have two daughters. One of them's name is story and the other one is fable. So <laughs> that's how much I love stories. So. Huh? Yeah. All right. Um, and before you did this, had you had any really weird experiences in your life? Um, definitely have had, you know, some strange things, uh, 
happen. Um, uh, nothing, I'm, you know, I've never had any UFO experiences. I've never had any um, direct like sightings of say Bigfoot or anything like that. But definitely, uh, there were some weird encounters in Eastern Kentucky with. Um, there, there's always been sort of a, a weird cult. Um, uh, angle to everything for some weird reason. Definitely when I was in Eastern Kentucky growing up, um, the the idea that there were cults you know, there was always a, you know, it's, it's, it's heavy Bible belt. Right, you know, right. It's, it's deep in the mountains, you know, Southern Baptist, and everybody's talking about um, people driving around in vans, uh, snatching children, you know, and especially blonde haired, you know, blue eyed children. And, sure. And, and so, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the midst of the satanic panic, you know, I played D and D, you know, yep. And, yep, and, me too. And, and was persecuted by, you know, uh, educational authorities for, for, you know, playing, but, um, but definitely there were people when I was growing up who dabbled in magic that I don't think they should have dabbled in, you know, um, that probably didn't know what they were doing. And so there were some like weird encounters with that, with kind of like people who were irresponsibly conducting rituals and not really knowing what they were doing um, to ill effect. And, um, and I, I saw some things like that, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and I've heard a lot of strange stuff out in the, in the woods um, in Eastern Kentucky, but, but no, but no, 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 no really uh, crazy experiences. Um, But, I can't say that I really want a crazy experience, you know? <laughs> but but uh, I definitely love researching um, the experiences. I don't know, you know, I'm a junkie for for weirdness. You know, I, I love it when people tell me that they they had a strange experience, and it's one of those things where it's like you're you're trying to wrap your mind around it. And I like approaching things that way. You know, I, I yeah. like trying to wrap my mind around it. You know. And, uh, but yeah, you know, it's just, it's just always been a passion of mine, you know, uh, all of the Charles Fort stuff, you know, oh, yeah. and honestly too, you know, it's, it's crazy. The deeper that I've gotten into, uh, the research of everything, you know, you find out, you know, in the show we mentioned, um, the Kentucky meat shower. Yes. Um, and it's so like a piece of that meat was in the, uh, the special collections at Transylvania university while I was there. And I didn't even think to, to, you know, I didn't find out about that till after I was out of college. And I was like, man, I should have, I should have went and looked at the piece of meat. <laughs> well, t- t- tell people about that. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, God, I can't think of the name of the town off the, oh, it's okay. Springs, uh, Olympia Springs. That's where it was. Olympia Springs, Kentucky. And, um, God, this was back in the late 1800s. Um, that uh, meat fell from the sky. And uh, um, these people witnessed it. They gathered it up. Uh, people came from, uh, you know, their neighbors came over. And and, it, and there were large chunks of meat, you know. Um, you know, I think some of them were like two to three inches in size. And the weirdest thing is that they actually tasted the meat. Yeah. <laughs> and, and said that it tasted like um, mutton. Uh, or you know, sheep, young young sheep, uh, or kind of like goat flavor. Um, but you know, there were tons of witnesses. It's very heavily documented, um, and then one of those pieces was preserved ultimately in, at Transylvania University. But it's it's you know, Kentucky has, and I, I think that story actually appears in uh, Charles Fort's um, Book of the Damned. I think I think it's in that one. Um, but you know, it's a strange story. You know, I think everybody's heard stories of like fish falls and frog falls yep, and, yep. and things like that. Um, but one, you know, once I knew about that, I think I brought that up to uh, Dan Dutton. You know, who's in uh, figures heavily into Penny Royal, um, and he's connected to a lot of the strangeness here. He's a famous Kentucky artist, and um, his family's lived here for a, a very long time on this same piece of property. Um, off of Highway 39, which is kind of like a really uh, mag- place where weirdness is magnified, um, on a farm that he calls Dandyland. Um, it's where his art studio is and his sculpture studio. And so uh, when I brought up, you know, the deeper he got sort of into this and and um, the more that we talked about <laughs> about the strangeness in Pulaski County and around Somerset, 
when I brought up the meat fall, he was like, oh, there are tons of stories of meat falls and frog falls here on, you know, on uh, Highway 39. He was like, my parents talked about it, all these old, old folks, um, you know, that have lived here, talked about it. And, and I was like, what? You know, this is crazy. <laughs> but it, he, he had they documented all these stories about it happening there. Wow. And it was sort of a, a common occurrence, you know, not not a common, but, you know, it was like people knew it did happen, you know, yeah. and uh, and it wasn't just from, say, uh, you know, a, a tornado picking up some fish from a pond right. and dropping it. And that explanation has never been satisfactory to me because when no. you get when you get like, oh, it's a fish fall, but it's one particular type of fish and nothing else. Like, right. Or like that's or a lot the, of fish to have picked up without anything else. Right. right. And then, and, you know, people always talk, the, the main uh, explanation for it is vultures, you know? Oh, yeah. And that, yeah. that, that they vomited all at once an entire flock of, uh, <laughs> of vultures. And I'm like, you know, I don't know. It, for me, you know, honestly, and I didn't talk about this in the show because it's, they're always like, to me, this is standard Fordian phenomena. But then there's that step beyond this when, you know, when you talk about like star jellies um, or, um, you know, the, have you heard these stories of the um, the the entities that they think are these like jelly like entities that they're like um, amoeba like in, in the atmosphere uh, <laughs> in the atmosphere? Yeah, yeah. In the atmosphere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And and th- I think there's even a book where someone tried to track these things down. They had all these stories, and to me, I'm like, is that what it is? You know, <laughs> did right. one of these things die, and you know, the meat fell, you know, and <laughs> and slowly evaporated, but they were able to preserve some of it, you know. Uh, but you know, you can't take people that far because that's that's pretty strange, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what uh, did anyone ever analyze that meat? I mean, you said it was in the the college <sighs> there. The, you know, this was back in the late 1800s. They they definitely said it was meat of some sort. Um, so I mean, it's real. The meat's there. I don't think anyone's in the modern in modern times has uh, taken it. But it's, I think it's in formaldehyde too. So it's probably been broken down yeah. by that. But I would be curious. I mean, wouldn't you love to do a DNA analysis if they, if you could still? Well, and and on- I. I think they did that with like the the blood rain in India, didn't they? And they found out it was like it was blood cells, but without oh, I forget what it was. They did. You're right. They they, they did test that, and it was blood, but it was strange. There was something strange about it. Yeah, it was missing something that normal blood would have, and I can't remember what it was. Oh God. Anyway, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's so weird, man. Yeah, I mean, all the fall stuff. It, it, you always wonder, is there like a portal opening up somewhere? You know, this is dropping through, you know. So, uh, I don't know. It's fascinating, though. I, I, but I was just, I was blown away once we really were digging deep into the show um, to, to find those stories here locally. You know, uh, I think Olympia Springs is near Maysville. It's like northeastern Kentucky, so it's like two, a couple hours away. Um, but, um, but to find those same stories, you know, I was like, you know, there's, there, there definitely seems to be an element of that, um, strangeness here. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And I mean, that stuff, but that stuff happens all over the world and has been yeah. for as long as we've had records and it's just like, is it a glitch in the matrix? You know, I know, I know that it is one of those things where it's, um, it's, it's so verifiable. You know, there's so many witnesses when something like that yeah. happens. But, uh, oh, the movie Magnolia. Yes, I love the ending of that. Yeah, so, you know, that's one of those things where it's like, to me, I guess, when I think about uh, the meat rain or, you know, frog falls, I I have this sort of idea in my head that it's it's connected to some greater magic. You know, because in, in Magnolia, that's that scene, you know, it's kind of like it all comes together and culminates in that moment. And right. You got to think if something strange like that happens anywhere, you know, especially even with the meat rain that that something something else was going on too. It's it's just not that simple, you know. Right, and and what what did the kids say while it was happening? This is just one of these things that happens. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, that de- that, that, that definitely defines it right there. You know, it is it is one of these things we can't really explain it, or we don't really know what it is, but it happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's great though. No. <laughs> yeah, but but um, yeah, that's just one another one of those things that I um, that I dug into, you know, and and uh, and started looking at here. So, Panther sightings too, man. Those are those are huge here. Yeah. We, don't, we don't really talk about that that much in the show. I think in the second season, well, that, the, the number one thing that I ran across while interviewing people, I probably have over 100 interviews with, with people that um, involve sightings of, you know, alien uh, big cats, you know, right. of, of black panthers, which absolutely cannot exist here. In this, and they've never been, I think it was like, 1923 is the last time that a melanistic cougar was sighted north of Mexico. Really? And, I yeah, mean, is, and, it, is, but, it, is it possible for them to survive there? I, I guess it's possible, but no remains have ever been found. Oh, you know, I mean, yeah, there's just, yeah. and, and, and the size of the animals that people are describing. Someone had a, um, <laughs> this is kind of strange that a couple weeks ago, a, um, a local folklorist. She actually has a PhD in folklore. Um, she has a, a publication um, uh, uh, about folklore, you know, that, that, and she's a researcher here in town. I love talking to her about all this stuff because, you know, for me that, you know, this is all folklore. Um, and, uh, and she's, she, she always asks me like, how do you feel about making yourself part of the story? You know, cause that, that taints the folklore, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, but she she had a sighting of a uh, black panther, and they call they call them painters here, you know, uh, with the, the the local dialect. But huh. um, but she posted about it. She freaked out, and she said it. You know, it was large enough from tail to head to stretch across the road. You know, so you're you know you're talking about like you know a four to six foot long you know animal. Yeah. Um, um, Darian uh, West, who's uh, uh, my research partner and he's an associate producer on the show when he went to find the meteorite um that we mentioned in the first episode of penny royal yeah. he came across he had a he had his uh, very first black panther sighting and so um and dan has one like but but just random people that i interviewed they all have these stories about these black cats and you know if you look at kills research um, and and just a, a lot of other researchers that are they're researching high strangeness in window areas. It seems like there's a correlation between sightings of these black panthers, you know, that, or these alien. You know, obviously they're not actually alien, but they're alien in the sense that they, they shouldn't be indigenous to the area. Right, right. And and uh, these alien big, you know, it's like England. It's an island. There shouldn't be any. <laughs> yeah. There's. You know, in England, but for some reason, in these highly energetic areas where all of this high strangeness is happening, people see these black panthers, and and that's the number one story that I got from people were these black panther sightings. But no one's ever found one. No one's ever shot one. No one's ever ever actually gotten a picture of one. I, I, but everyone, you know, seen it. You know. I wonder if that's how our brain translates the weird energy, you know, like, cause seeing a large cat is not that weird if you're out in the country. I mean, it is because they don't belong there. So if we're seeing something that our brain can't process, maybe it's saying, well, we'll just show you a black cat because it's still strange, but we have to put a face on it. Yeah. And, and it's like, it is moving, you know. It's not like someone's seeing one of these things sitting somewhere, right? You know, it's always moving. And like you said, it, what if it is some type of like, it's an energy or a current in the place, and somehow, it, yeah, it manifests, you know, in their consciousness that where their perception that way. Well, it's that, like people seeing owls, you know, when they have the, you know, an ET encounter, right? You know, right. You know, yeah. it, and you know they attribute that to screen memory, but I, I would think that in some of these cases, it's not a screen memory; it's that we can't see it for what it is. Yeah. Well, it, it, isn't there the story of the um, Native Americans that saw the ships coming um, with Columbus or one of the early and they, explorers? And they couldn't see them. 
Yeah, they couldn't see the ships, and, but they because their minds couldn't process what they were looking at. Yeah, until I, the, I, I think I sure. heard that story initially on what the bleep do we know? <laughs> and then I heard someone say that totally wasn't true. So I never really looked into it. I don't know if that was actually true or not. I, I've never looked into it either. I just accept it as true. But <laughs> but I do know. I mean, there definitely are stories of cognitive blindness, though. Oh yes, you absolutely. Know? Yeah. So so I, I, you know, it's one of those things I I could accept it just because I know that that kind of thing does happen. You yes. Know? Um, but definitely, you know, I don't know, man. You you think about a, a completely pre-industrial society, you know, where where things are not that way at all you know like obviously they had boats and canoes but to see a a ship of that size but, you know and, and then again though you look at the cargo cults out in like southeast asia and stuff you know they don't they, that's a whole different thing but i mean they're obviously seeing the stuff they just don't understand it yeah no i love the cargo cult stories and john from you know the yeah. uh that they that they're worshiping John from because one of the soldiers was named. He was, you know, a lot of them were named John from Cincinnati or right, John from right. Baltimore. And so John from was going to return. He was this like messianic figure. <laughs> well, it, I mean, but it's true, man. I mean, a lot of this stuff, even with Penny Roll, uh, so much of it has been about perception, you know, yes. and, and, and about, how people are interacting with, you know, uh, at this point, I think saying the phenomena sounds cliche. <laughs> but that's <laughs> what it is. You know, it's what it is, you know, but it's like whatever the phenomena is, but it's like whatever's happening, it is something to do with the way we as humans and as observers of reality are interacting with something that we don't understand, you know, and it's yeah, like, yeah that somehow in the gap between those things, this, this manifests, you know, this the weirdness manifests, you know, maybe it's, it's like an uncanny Valley just for strangeness, you know, you know, not, not for just like perceiving something that's, that's, that's not natural, you know? Well, this, this is also why I've for the last year or so I've been encouraging people to read the invisible gorilla, which oh, is, yeah. Which is just such a, a important book on how we perceive and how we remember things and stuff like that. And even though they don't touch on the paranormal in there, I mean, they're two psychologists. The fact is it, it holds a lot of uh, information on how we would also then perceive the paranormal. If, we, if, if our senses for normal things are as unreliable as they are, then when you add the strangeness into it, it's a whole nother situation, you know? Um, dude, I had never heard of that book until you mentioned that. I was listening to that episode, and you, or I forget which, was it on the Surprise Mechanism? Yeah, I think I mentioned it on there. Yeah, and and, and so the, immediately, I, you know, I hopped on Amazon. I was like, I oh, mean, I've never heard of this before, you know? Um, but it reminded me of a, um, of a book about, oh, God, what is the name of it? It's, it's... A, the guy, he studies all of these people that have um, uh, mental issues like, you know, cognitive uh, distortions. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the guys sees his wife as a coat rack. Oh. Do you know what book I'm talking about? No. But yeah, I'm try, I was trying to remember what... Um, what the name of I'll have to tell you about it later, but but anyway, but but it, it it's the each of the stories in the book. Oh, that's what it was. The man who mistook the man who mistook his wife for a hat, right? Huh. And it's it's by Oliver Sacks, and um, all of the stories in the book are about people that have very you know um, visual agnosia, um, you know amnesia, the retrograde amnesia. Like all kinds of weird, like their perception of reality is completely distorted in a physical way that we can study. Um, so, so then it's like, you know, I mean, for all intents and purposes, what they're seeing is paranormal, right? Right. But, but it's, but it is, um, you know, we can trace it back to some, 
you know, a filter in their mind is damaged in some yeah. way. You know, but it's like, what if the phenomena that we're perceiving or interacting with these filters that we have can't filter that type of information, right? Um, you know, one of the biggest things that we came across in this research that that's going to be in the second season heavily is a connection between um, schizophrenia and magic and this concept of like archetypes, you know, young yeah. and archetypes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, Jung st studied schizophrenia heavily. Um, but, the, oh, and the tarot, you know, I didn't know that, that the or original tarot was commissioned by the Medici family. And they commissioned an artist, and they wanted an artist found who was suffering from, you know, obviously it wasn't called uh, schizophrenia at the time. But they wanted an artist who suffered from these manic episodes. And they waited until he was in the throes of a manic episode to get him to create the original tarot. Well, the, and, ori the original tarot goes back slowly over time. Yeah, but there, there's a story about this, though. It's, I don't know if it's the right, it's not the right or wait, but. But what one of the you mean one of the popular decks though was created that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That 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 it was created through this, you know, through through trying to have this um, person who was probably schizophrenic but definitely prone to manic episodes, who was off the street, um, but was a, a talented artist to channel this symbolism, basically, right? Hmm. Um, God, I'll have to. I'll find it and I'll send it to you though, because right. this is. Um, um, someone contacted me and stressed that I. It was another one of those sort of odd messages, you know, yeah. uh, that I've been receiving from people who um, kept telling me to not forget the um, the hanged man, and, and and multiple times said, "Do not, Nathan, do not forget the hanged man," and. You know, I, I have no background on, in magic, you know, or tarot or anything like that. And um, I, I looked at that and I thought, well, you know, maybe this is, they've said it a few times in this message to me. And it was sort of random too. It wasn't even connected to the, to the other stuff. And I looked, you know, I was like, all right, let's look up the hanged man card. Let's do a little bit of research on that. And I found that that card is um, uh, the only card in the tarot that has been officially replaced uh, with a different name. And the deck that does that is the African-American tarot deck. And they changed the name of the hanged man to the observer. Wow. Right? And it's... Um, the on the card, it's the sky is filled with eyeballs, and there's this guy that's sitting with his he's blindfolded, right? Right. But his legs are he's sitting, but his legs are crossed like the the original image. Well, th I dug a little deeper, and it turns out the person that's blindfolded is Efa, and that's the Dan Dutton is has been inducted into the as a priest of Efa. Right. And for, it was just one of these weird things. It was like we started I started to dig into it. And it was like the cards called the observer. And if, and if you listen to Penny Royal, obviously, when we get to that eighth episode, it's this whole concept of, you know, second order cybernetics and, and whether or not, you know, we as observers are affecting sort of the reality and it being observed by the system. And it was just strange to me. You know, it was strange that this person was sending me. Some some fairly wild messages, um, sort of about the end of the world and and some things like that. And in the midst of it, they mentioned you know that. And um, I don't know. It's just it's just one of those things we you know I'm not I'm not saying that person was schizophrenic, but we've done a lot of research into schizophrenia and, and definitely this area. You know, Pulaski County is has a, a massive problem with mental illness. I mean, it's just, it's just off the charts. You know, we, we even mentioned in the show that 
you know, an eastern state, which is in Lexington, you know, about an hour and a half north of here, they take people from all over the state and different people that we've interviewed that have worked there. 70% of the people in eastern state, and again, they take people from all the counties in Kentucky, 70% are from Pulaski County from here, you know. And and that's just another one of those strange things of, of you know, what's happening here that's that's causing sort of a distortion in people's perceptions of things, you know. Yeah, or affecting their their emotional states. Yeah. 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 What? Is that why people see things? <laughs> what, what was that? I don't, I don't know. I said, you know, is that why people see things here? You know, is it? Is it? Uh, you know, and that that obviously led into the whole research with the Kentucky anomaly, you know, I mean, right. that was, that was surprising to find, you know, that this was such a, you know, this County is right over top of, um, of what NASA calls the Kentucky anomaly. You know, it's this, the largest spike of geomagnetic energy in the Western hemisphere is here. And that was odd. You know, it's like you find things like that. It's like, does that correlate to all of these other things? You know? Probably. I mean, isn't Sedona one as well? Yeah, Sedona's one, uh, and that that too. Not to not to go back to this episode so much, but definitely this was you know uh, when you get the Sarai's mechanism episode that you did. Um, you guys even I think Timothy Renner mentioned the fact that he had gotten those magnetic maps yes. of the to- Toad Road area, you know, and and then you guys even talked about quartz yeah. being concentrated. Yeah. You know, and there, and that's the thing here. It's it. You know, when you have quartz and really powerful geo geomagnetic fields or electromagnetic fields, it causes the piezoelectric effect, right? Mm-hmm. And and that can affect people's brains. Yep. You know, they, they, you know, that's why I'm saying it's like some of this may not be paranormal so much as, um, you know, sort of this this weird geophysical phenomena um, that's happening here, but. Um, or or it's just opening people up to being able to see some of these things and interact yeah. with some of these things. But I, I, I found that really, again, that was one of those things that for me it was like red flag. You know, I really wanted to talk to you about what, you know, what you've thought about some of this stuff. Um, yeah, and, and was, I, I think it's hard to draw a line between like, okay, this stuff is affecting us and making us hallucinate versus this stuff is affecting us and allowing us to see things we normally wouldn't be able to. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, you know, and I talk about this in the, the show that my wife, you know, my wife doesn't believe in most of this stuff. You know, she entertains my my interest in it um, and is very loving of and supportive of, of these projects, but in this kind of research. But, you know, she's she, she had a couple of experiences where, you know, she did see a spatial distortion where the the. Uh, thermostat on the wall upstairs in front of our bathroom. She came out of the shower, middle of the day, and this this it moved across the wall, like three or four feet, and then down three or four feet, and then bounced back. <laughs> and and the first time it happened, you know, you know, she screamed for me. It was again, it was middle of the day. No one thought paranormal. We thought she was having an aneurysm or something. You mm, know? Right. And uh, but I, you know, the wall was fine. The thermostat was there. I could, you know, I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But two years later, it happened again, about the same time of year. Huh. And and so then you got to think, all right, so this is twice. You know, she doesn't subscribe to any of this paranormal stuff, you know, really. And I was just like, what's – was there some type of weird distortion? You, know, and you, you find all the stuff about the Kentucky anomaly. I mean, the NASA maps uh, indicate that this area has a distortion in gravity. Because of the intensity, right? right? And that's weird. So then it's like, could it have warped that field? Right. Um, but check this out. So so uh, these people that have been sending me, I haven't talked about this on, uh, before, but um, it's the first time I've really told anybody about this stuff other than Darian. But we, you know, we've been getting all these weird messages and, Definitely, one of the messages I got from someone was talking about the fact that um, there was a big long rant, kind of about the end of the world and about Pan and some weird stuff. Um, and they were warning me that I was I was pursuing the wrong research, right? Hmm. 
Hmm. But in the middle of it, this rant, they they just just this, there's a statement where it says the thermostat, the thermostat is where the man enters and exits your house. And then it went back into the rant. <laughs> right? And and that would have meant nothing to anyone else, right? But I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, this is strange, right? So then a few weeks ago, I got a message through the website and someone had listened to the show and really enjoyed it and said that they had been practicing astral projection for the last decade and that um, I think they lived in like Cincinnati or somewhere, but they would project themselves and they would pop out right where the thermostat was on the second floor of this house. <laughs> and so they'd listen to the show where I mentioned that and they were like, I'm curious if it was your house that I was entering. Right. <laughs> but I was like, it, it was so weird. It was like within a couple of weeks of getting the message from one person about, you know, that in a weird rant and then this other thing. And I was like, but that's how all of this is played out, you know? And, and I think that's, that's, sort of the nature of this and that and that's why I, I really felt like information theory and those concepts of cybernetics spoke to this phenomena because there's a weird feedback loop element to this right I, well i think too you gotta you always gotta be cautious of people like manipulating you as well yes totally like, like totally. you have no idea if those two people really knew one another that's true. That's totally true. Um, some, you know, one of the things too is that that's not in the first season is that um, we received a, a set of really weird documents, and it's going to be in the second season. But um, there's a question there of, you know, the documents involved a lot of stuff that we were researching, and they apparently were sealed in 2017, and they're kind of scary, weird government documents that someone asked Darian and I to data mine and uh the whole the whole thing about them is is strange and you can't you know we talked to richard spence you know that that wrote um uh, secret agent 666 um you know he's in in the show in, in the first season right and and also did the co-authored empire of the will with um walter bosley mm. which you know really why we contacted him was because of that because of the san bernardino murders and um but we we talked to him about these documents and he was like i don't know boys this sounds like a intelligence operation you know but he was just like it, it he was he doesn't see things in a paranormal way right and he was just like it seems like someone's trying to mess with you right you know right and 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 i do think that you have to you do have to be cautious about that and about people trying to insert themselves into the story in a sense. True. You know? That is that is uh, also true. And I mean, if you read Messengers of Deception from Valet, I mean, he talks about how the government infiltrates all these different UFO groups. You know, I mean, so is it that hard to imagine that if a, if a podcast comes out and starts taking a certain path that they're not also going to, you know, play games with them too? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. That, and that's what worried me was that some, some of the stuff has been too perfect, right? Um, uh, and I think that's that for me, the entire experience has been that's where both the the magic of it and the terror of it is, <laughs> is is finding like, you know, it's one thing to, to to interview people and they're like, I've had UFO experiences here, you know, or you know, the whole thing with the murders and the cults. It's like, you know, I don't think there's a cult here. I do think that. Um, there have been various groups here and, and I don't think any of them were aligned in any type of conspiracy, you know, to do anything. Uh, you know, I hope not. If that's the case, I don't think I'd be talking to you right now, you know, right, right. Um, but, 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 you know, a lot of strange groups did come here there. This is perceived as an energetic place and there are a lot of weird, um, weird things that have happened. Now, I just, I don't know, man. I just, I just don't see. Um, I just don't. It's just like something's happening here. You know, the Katerma stuff, right? That that 
that was layered into this. Um, even even the hellier stuff, you know, like I didn't know Greg, and I was working on all the pan stuff with with Dan before we ever met Greg, and so like that was weird. It, it, that's the thing I'm saying. It's like it's not that it's paranormal, but it's all just so weird. Yeah, uh, yeah. In in like a magnolia sense, right? <laughs> if you, if like when you lay all of this stuff out or stack it together, it makes a strange sandwich that it's all in this one place, and that you know, the, you just it's like there are these murders, these allegations of cults. You got Dan here, all this pan stuff going on. Then Hellier shows up, you know, with Greg and Dana, and and then they end up doing all this pan stuff here. But they didn't know Dan, you know, right, and didn't know right. what we were doing. And then that came out. And it was like, well, this is weird. What's what's this mean? And then when we dug back into this stuff, you know, because of all the cult stuff where they mentioned that Amy girl. And I was like, oh, there's no cult. But wait a second. Now they've been contacted by somebody. That's how we found Guterma, ultimately. Right. And it's like, how in the world did Alexander Guterma end up? in Somerset, and then he's doing business with Vice President Spiro Agnew here in Somerset. You know, and I just... And then on top of that, all the stuff from Oakwood with the channeling of these intelligences. Yeah. And I was just like, how could this get any weirder? <laughs> <laughs> it, well, and, 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 go on, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, uh, well, actually, let, let, let's go back a little bit, because we never talked about the name Penny Royal. Uh, yeah. So t- tell us where yeah. the name comes from. So uh, Penny Royal is a reference to um, the Penny Royal Plateau. And um, and I forget how many counties it, it, it encompasses, but basically it's from south of Lexington, um, you know, down through to the, to the, the bottom of the state, uh, east to where the Appalachian Mountains start, and then west to Hopkinsville. Um, but if you look at that area, it encompasses you know, uh, er- where Edgar Casey was born, uh, where the Stanford abductions happened, which were only really about 15 miles north of here. Um, uh, the Hopkinsville goblins, like there's just tons and tons of weirdness that happened in this region that's called the Penny Royal. Um, it's named after um, a, a, an herb that grows here called Penny Ryle. Um, which is a bastardization of Penny Royal. You know, people people here can't really say Penny Royal. They say Penny Royal, Penny Royal, you know. Mm. And um, that, but that herb is uh, referenced by Nirvana, you know, in Penny Royal, the song Penny Royal Tea. Uh, it's, a, it's one of three natural abortives um, that exists in the world, you know, wow. that's been used for thousands of years. So anyway, that, the, the, the fact that that grows here in such abundance, um, that's why. They they named the region the Penny Royal, and uh, and for me, you know, when I when I started researching all this and really digging into the the history of the area, I don't know. I mean, just that that was what I really gravitated to was this um, to that name, you know, to the, to the, to the concept of the Penny Royal because because of all the weirdness that that seems to be located just in that specific region. So yeah, and I, and I definitely think that place has an effect on numerous levels? I mean, when you're talking about the magnetic anomaly, does NASA know why there's an anomaly there? They do not. Um, it's based on... Um, uh, it's part of the lith- lithosphere, um, so something in the crust of the Earth is part of it, but there's also um, the core of the Earth, the way it spins. It's a conjunction between those fields and then something in the crust just beneath us uh, that that the interplay between those two things which causes it um like i said in the show you know sedona is another one of the big spikes right and then um southern alaska i like to believe that the southern alaska one is where um uh, what's her name uh not linda is it linda godfrey uh linda molten how Molten Howe, yeah, yeah. Linda Molten Howe talks about the pyramid in southern Alaska. Yeah, right. I, I, you know that's. <laughs> it's, I'm like, it, it's, uh, I'm that's like, a that's maybe. a fun story, but I'm ninety nine percent sure it's BS. Oh, it's total bullshit. You know what I mean? But it is one of those funny things where it's like, if you if you look at that, she, she would cling to this. <laughs> she would yeah. be like, 
see, see, there's a magnetic anomaly there. That's why it's there, you know. So, now, nah, but 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 definitely, I mean, it, it is a weird region, you know, and and um, I guess I didn't realize how weird it was going, like the entire area was going to be until I really began to dig into it, you know, and 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 see the connections. But um, yeah, it's just. It's interesting. I think the Edgar Casey connection, we didn't explore that at all. Um, I don't think I'm probably going to address that in the second season. But, you know, I mean, that's all of that's just you just don't realize how many people are connected to Kentucky. Um, you know, we Steven Snyder is uh, a big part of the of the first season. And he's a parapolitical researcher, great parapolitical researcher. Um, I don't know if you've ever talked to him before. No. Um, but he he. He was able to show us a lot of connections to Kentucky, not in a paranormal sense, you know, in a very parapolitical sense, where it was like, man, a lot of things are. The Kentucky, I, th- I feel like the perception of Kentucky often is that it's sort of just this southern state where people are backwards. But right, right. he find out that a lot of really crazy world events played out here. You know, or had some connection to this area, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, he 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 showed us so much stuff. I was like, I can't I can't put that all in the show, man. <laughs> it's just too too much, too weird. You know, it's too too much conspiracy stuff. So, and and but, uh, and you mentioned hell yeah, you had uh, uh, Greg on one of the shows. Yeah, so Greg was on um, the fifth episode. Um, you know, I. I appear in Hellier season two, um, and I think it's the eighth episode, the secret Commonwealth. Um, and, and that was a strange thing that, that, you know, Dan Dutton, who I've been working on this Fawn film with and done a lot of projects with his great opus, you know, his four part, uh, opera dance opera series, uh, that was filmed by KET and, you know, shown everywhere is called the secret Commonwealth. And, um, and and then he's obviously got his fawn opera, and so when Greg came down here, you know they they inter- they knew Kyle, um, who's a, a associate producer on the, the show too, but also just a friend of mine um, who runs the Paranormal Museum here in town. How, how many towns have a paranormal paranormal museum? Right, and uh, right. you know that that's another weird thing about Somerset. But um, Kyle travels, you know, all over the U.S. You know, pre-COVID, when when we could actually go to conventions and stuff, and right. he had met um, Greg and Dana, and so obviously we'd seen Hellier, the first season of it, but they'd come to Somerset and they talked to him and wanted to know some stories. And we didn't know that they were filming anything, and then they asked if if there was anybody else that um, that they should talk to that might might have some stories and he said you know nathan's been researching the area and has all this stuff so and that's that's kind of how that that transpired but again like i said you know it was weird that there was an intersection with what we were researching in terms of whether there was a cult here and then greg and, and dana had received those uh, messages you know and I, and I think it's 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 just one of those strange things too that dan and i were working on um this fawn film and he had had this, you know, if you listen to the fourth episode, which I think for me, it's a personal favorite just because I love Dan so much and I love Dan's stories. And it was an honor for me to get to capture that story of that experience that he had in Elkhorn City. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And with, with Pan, you know, and 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 Dan's whole life is sort of built on on sort of a lot of of strangeness and and a lot of his work was very deep into uh the experience experiential nature of thing of art and so you know he thinks he encounters you know the archetype of pan in Elkhorn City while he's working on um, this fawn opera well you know it's weird too that Elkhorn City Hellier is in a suburb of Elkhorn City right, right. And so, you know, when Dan told me this wild story about this experience that he had in Elkhorn City, and again, at the time we started working on this, I didn't know about Hillier. You know, we, this was 
started two years before Hellier ever came out. And Dan tells me about this experience back in 2007. I was like, Dan, you've, you've got to let me capture that. But because I, I, you know, I'm also a filmmaker and, and um, I've got a channel called uh, Summer Sessions on YouTube where we shoot music videos with a lot of bands from around the U.S. Nice. And um, so, so anyway, but I do a lot of like filmmaking stuff. And so I was like, Dan, you got to let me make this film, you know, where we take you back to Elkhorn City. We try to recreate the same experience you had. And let's restage the Fawn Opera in Brakes Interstate Park, which is a liminal place. You know, it's a park that's between two states. Mm. It's like one of the only parks in you know America that that's that way. And and a lot of Dan's work is focused on liminality. And so I was like, you know, we've got to go back there. We'll stage the opera with new dancers and uh, new actors and teach them these because a lot of his works about ritualism <laughs> and, and so you know well that's what we've been working on for, for for the last couple of years you know like three years or so two or three years and um then when hellier came out and obviously the the eighth episode was <laughs> the secret commonwealth and then the final episode of the second season was you know the night of pan and they perform a ritual to pan here in somerset in a cave uh which is tied to these murders <laughs> to all this stuff it was just weird because i was like i'd never talked about any of that stuff with greg it was just strange that we were going to elkhorn city to do this which is where hillier is and then they were coming you know from that area to somerset to and it is in a way do the same thing you know, um, but what we were doing, what we've been doing is totally irrespective of them. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I've been researching this stuff. That was just a weird intersection that that I, I find hard to explain. But really, it's just another part of the weirdness of this whole thing that that, you know, I, it doesn't have anything to do with them, but so much to do with. I don't know. It's just this stacking of weirdness in this one specific place. And, and you mentioned place, and that was the thing too in the episode that you did on the um, Sarai's me- mechanism with um, with Tim uh, Renner that you guys were talking about place. Yeah, and and that for me too, because you know the the sort of the tagline of Penny Royal is the magic and mystery of place. And right. that's what I really wanted to discover was like, how does a place affect the people that live there? But also, how do the people affect the place and the folklore? Right, right. And yeah, I, I think there is a give and take there, definitely. Yeah, it, it's a weird thing, too, to ponder. It's a chicken or egg sort of situation. But um, I do think, you know, that there are places that have earth energies Yes. And or something, something about the place. There's some power or energy inherent in a place, and it absolutely affects the people. But there is sort of this feedback loop that the people also are somehow giving the place something that it's also feeding off of, right? Or, or affecting it. But um, your whole theory that you had about this was, I was like, this is. This is exactly what we've, you know what I mean? I was like, <laughs> you, you, you've been working on this, you know? Um, I mean, that's really why, why I wanted to, you know, that we I reached out to talk to you because I was like, man, Sarai is really like, you got, you're dialed into this. This is, you know, you're thinking this, this same thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And at, at one point I was looking at writing a book based on just like how the environment affects our paranormal experiences but it's expanded a lot since then so that's only now a part of it uh i feel like there's this web of stuff that that affects how we experience everything you know and that includes the paranormal and part of that is place part of that is the you know the 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 energy of the people it's the energy of the environment uh and it's what we put out into the environment and what the environment does to us yeah yeah, I mean, it's. I don't think people look at that enough. No, when they're researching this stuff, 
Um, and I think that's like the first place you should go <laughs> go to. You know, when you're when you're looking, you know, something happens to someone in a place. I almost feel like you need to start with the place and then work back. You know, right, right. Um, to the experience because it's true. I mean. I mean, even like we were talking about the Black Panther stuff, you know, like maybe it is just like you said, you know, they're they're seeing, you know, a movement of of something or maybe just even of energies in this area and their brains can't process it. So it processes it as a Black Panther jumping across the road. I mean, that's the most common thing is that people see a Black Panther cross the road. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's, it's almost like it almost harkens back. To sort of a cultural memory of the superstition of a black cat crossing the road. Yeah, it, it could very well be a part of it. Yeah, yeah, and but people, those are the questions that have to be asked. I think when you approach any of this, because something is, people are having experiences. Yes, right, and and that's undeniable. An experience has been had. Um, I don't think it's as simple as being like it's a UFO or it's a Bigfoot right. or it's this. Right. Or it's that, you know, that yeah. the people are so quick. It, it, even with the kill stuff, I mean, think about when there were all those reports of the families that saw the UFO sightings in the um, uh, that area where the Silver Bridge was, right? Yep. And when they saw the UFO and it left, then they had poltergeist activity for the right. next few days. Right. And it's like, so what's the what's the connection there? Um. And so I, I, I absolutely don't think that these are separate phenomena. I definitely think it's a single phenomena of some sort. I mean, God, I don't know what it is. I don't think <laughs> like we're not going to find out what it is, but definitely well, because of Penny Royal, we continue to interact with it. Um, and, and I think. And we, as well as place, I think, you know, we, we did a show years ago called uh, Everything is Demons, you know, talking about how people will assign all the weird stuff is demonic somehow. Right. You know, and it's based on belief rather than actually, you know, looking at the at data or anything like that. But I jokingly will say that my, my belief now is that everything is poltergeists <laughs> because you see poltergeist activity through all of it. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, we, we know from size studies that poltergeist activity can come from us. That's not a far stretch from the laboratory studies we've done where we show, you know, mind can control matter. Even if it's only in micro examples in the lab, it doesn't, you know, the lab isn't an emotionally charged situation. So if you're in the right area or if you're in the right emotional state, then you could be producing, you know, poltergeist energy, whatever that is, that psychokinetic energy. And then add into it, you know, other factors, and something might also be able to pick up on that energy and use it to interact with us. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of, one of the things too that I uh, started to come across when I was researching stuff here um, was that people had poltergeist activity, but it only happened once. Oh yeah. So like, yeah. so they would see like in their room an object would float off a shelf across the room and then drop to the floor. And that's the only experience they ever had. <laughs> right. And it's, it, but, but there are, an, but I've cataloged a number of those in this specific place. Right. It may, just, was, it may be that the energy of the place was just right at that one point to interact with them, to, to create that poltergeist. Yeah. 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 Or even, or and of course, for me, uh, I hadn't thought about the poltergeist thing until you know uh, I've, I've started to listen to some of the uh, to the to your theory about this, and I, and I do agree with you, though. I, I think that is a, definitely a part of this, and um, but I, of course, the first thing I thought of was spatial distortions. You know that, that, that somehow, somehow that object was being distorted and moved across the room by the the intense geomagnetic energy here. You know, but. But I think you're right, though. I think I think it's probably more likely that somehow that this place and those energies are interacting with the minds of people, and you know, which are, which are producing, you know, limited psi phenomena. Right. You know. And, yeah, and, and it's also possible, and and I almost hate making making this comment because it, it feels like it's it's I don't know. 
Like it's possible that people experience poltergeists without ever noticing. Oh yeah. You yeah, know, like yes. like something moves, but they just didn't notice it moved. And so they just, you know, it it doesn't register. And how often does something like that happen and we just don't notice? I mean, maybe never. But like the whole point is we wouldn't notice, so who knows? What's it's it's like losing your keys too. Right. You know? it's, right. It's, it's it's did you just misplace your keys or did your keys get misplaced by this phenomenon? Right. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's very possible that that it could be. I think a lot of things are happening all around us constantly, and we absolutely just are not. We're filtering it out. You know, we're we, definitely that, that, filtering it out. You know, all the studies of those, you know, kids being able to. I mean, we know scientifically that is it uh, under eleven. There's an age or sort of an approximate age where children can take this psychological test and there are objects in the test that they can perceive that adults cannot perceive. Right, right, right. You know, and it's like, there we're, are we're taught by our culture what to filter out, filter out. Yes. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, in this research, I haven't really talked about this before, but cause I haven't really figured out a way to formulate this, but, but I'll mention it here because I, I'm curious what you think. Um, when you think about all this stuff and you're, and you're hearing, uh, you know, people have so many different sightings of, you know, UFO, UFO, um, you know, <laughs> beings or right. yeah, well, yeah. whatever just it is. Right. And, and there's just so many, there's such a crazy, you know, diaspora of things that are encountered. I was like, what about if you were in. Watch if you watch David Attenborough documentaries, right, about the rainforest. Okay. And you and you think about any of those organisms, right? There is this crazy hierarchy of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different organisms in that single ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. And most of them are not aware of any of the others. Because they don't interact with them directly, right, you know. Right, right. So, like an ant on a tree at a certain level in the forest doesn't have any idea about a beetle on the surface floor of that forest. Yeah. Right. And and it's not a predator. They don't eat each other. But sometimes that beetle or that ant crawls up the tree or down the tree, and they encounter each other. But they're not actually part of the same food chain. Or any type of they, you know, it's just a rare occurrence. But when you think about us, and we're we're like, well, we see this, we perceive an ecosystem around us. But it's the what if there's an an unperceived ecosystem that we're filtering out? Oh yeah, with with a wide range of beings and creatures, and they don't mess with us because they don't need to. They don't eat us. They don't derive energy from us. Right. Some. Some do, you know, and probably those are the things that, you know, attach themselves to people. But um, it's just like, while we we don't need to know about those things because it's not part of our survival. Yes. And, and, yeah. and so we filter it all out. You know, that ant doesn't know about a hawk. It just doesn't know what a hawk is. <laughs> right. But that hawk still exists. And still may eat something that eats the ant some down, you know, some way down the line. But um, that I've just been thinking about that a lot lately because you, the more you research all this and the more that you encounter these stories, people have such a wide, varied reporting of encounters and stories that you can't fit it all <laughs> under one umbrella. You know, you can't say. That it's one thing, but that doesn't mean that all of them don't exist together. You know, that's like yeah, saying yeah, yeah. just just because you can't perceive a certain thing in the rainforest that nothing exists in the rainforest. Yeah. And and so I just I think that we need to look at this stuff in a way more holistic way. You know, not not I'm saying not in a new agey holistic way, but in, in terms of asking questions. I think we need to ask a lot broader questions about what 
what this is that we're all encountering. You know? and, and, and what drives me nuts is when you see like uh, articles about scientists searching for life in the cosmos. And it's like, you know, there could be life on every single planet that we simply don't recognize. Oh, yeah, yeah. There, there could be intelligent life in the clouds of Venus or, or the clouds of Jupiter, and we don't recognize it. We're not looking for it because we don't know what to look for other than carbon-based life forms. Right, right. And, and even if, you know, if, if we entertain the idea of, you know, multiple dimensions, right. you know, the fact that yeah, I always think it's funny that some contactees will mention Venusians, right? Mm -hmm. But then another contactee says that there's another type of entity that lives on Venus. And so, so ultimately you get 1,500 different people with 1,500 different <laughs> versions of aliens on right, Venus. Right, right. And you're like, well, they all can't exist on Venus together. But it's like, well, what if there are multiple dimensions or multiple <laughs> possibilities? And right. these people are simply encountering possibilities or whatever. You know, you get into some crazy um, quantum mechanics. So, yeah, I mean, all that. It's just like. You can't discount any of this stuff, but but that's part of the magic of it too, and the mystery of it. I think um, um, that's what I enjoy the most about it. Now, when you were talking about, uh, well, actually, one of the things I, I wanted to point out, uh, th there was some really, oh, I can't remember what it was. It was a really crazy story that Greg told on on the show, um, but I don't remember what it was. I was just like, wow, that one's way out there. Um, but, like, one of the things with Hellier that, that I didn't actually watch the whole second season, I stopped when they said they had proved that uh, Indrid Cold was real. <laughs> and I stopped and went, no, you didn't. What the hell? And it just it, it bugged me. And when he was on your show, he said something like, uh, oh, he was talking about the initial messages they were sent and how this guy was sending him photographs. And he's like, so here we have hard evidence. I'm like, that's not hard evidence. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. You know, those are photographs. Photographs are easily faked. But I, right. I feel uh, like right from the beginning of Hell Year, I felt like someone was playing them. Yeah, that, that was the thing, too. Like, um, uh, you, you just wonder some of the stuff that we've come across, too, with, with um, Alan Greenfield, right? And he might be uh, the one playing them. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Here's one thing that that made me think about some of this stuff in a in a weird way was that um, Richard Richard Spence sent us a uh, he, he we we correspond with Darian and I do frequently with just sending research back and forth the stories we find and so he was like hey boys you know here's this story about in uh, I think it was in Halifax uh, it was up in Nova Scotia. Okay. That uh, the Canadian military got caught um, running a psyops where they were trying to convince people in this small town that there were, were packs of wolves killing people. And so the military was driving around in these vehicles with these speakers blasting these wolf calls, you know, these packs. And they got caught doing it. <laughs> it was a big scandal. Huh. And it, it, But it turned out that the group that was doing it was their psyops organization, um, and I think in Hellier when they're researching the IP addresses, that one of the IP addresses from the emails goes back to this area where this psyops group is located, uh -huh. right? And and even even when when we were doing you know Penny Royal, we were getting massive hits. From a military base in uh, Georgia before the show came out, oh. we've got like because Darian Darian monitors all this stuff. You know, he's you know we we work on apps and do a lot of data mining, and so he was like, "Man, we're getting all kinds of traffic from this place. And the show's not out, right?" And so it's like, are there some? <laughs> Is someone messing? You know, is it is it a psyops? You know, yeah. but then also when you when you think about Alan Greenfield, one of the things that pops up in our research and some connections is to Adam Parfrey with from Feral House and um, and some connections to Robert Anton Wilson um, and <laughs> you know Robert Anton Wilson was part of you know Carrie Thornley the whole Discordian movement. 
Right, right. And the, those guys, uh, you know, they ran Operation Mind, you know, <laughs> uh, DF word, you know. Yeah. Um, and they were disseminating false information into the paranormal and the conspiracy community mm-hmm. to see what happened. And so Alan Greenfield was associated with Thornley. He was, you know, on the outskirts of that prank. Yeah, you know, and then we can even we can even look at Kill with uh, what's his name, who admitted to oh, pranking him. Uh, Bender. No, the 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 dude that well yeah Bender and then the guy that wrote the Silver Bridge. Yeah, book, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, it's guy. Yeah, it's I'm drawing a blank. But but you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Though. Yeah. Um, that they were like. You know, we we pranked him. We, yeah. we you know we're messing with him, and so you know what are the odds that that some of this stuff? I, I definitely think that that things that we've encountered are people messing with us in some way. Um, why I don't know. I mean, definitely, I mean, we received a series of documents that I I'm absolutely telling you um, are the craziest things that I've ever seen before. They're documents that we don't mention this in the first season. Like I said, it's going to be you know in the second season. But these documents mention stuff that I, I was when we got the documents and then someone wanted us to data bind the documents. I was like, man, I don't think we should have these things. You know, there's the stuff that's contained in here. But then the more we dug into it, the more it related to our research specifically, mm. and like like even mentioned people we were talking to. Right, you know, and um, and people that were in the show, and so I was like, there is no way that these documents ended up in our hands after all this other stuff that we found here, and that someone's not, you know, maybe they sent it to multiple groups, and maybe we're just the prime candidates for the prank. Right, you know? right. Um, Spence has a theory that possibly there's something contained in the documents that someone wants to release, but they don't want to be connected to the release of that information. So they, because we had the podcast, because we were doing this research, it was like, if we give it to these, but they could have given it to multiple people. We just were the most likely to distribute it. And he said, you know, it's probably something that you, you don't see any importance in. Um, but there's a lot of weird stuff about Kentucky in the documents, and can, you know, can, they even, can, can can you give us one thing that's in there? Uh, the the gist of the documents is about um, Yamashita's gold and the gold from War, World War II and the movement of the gold um, um, to um, to hide it, basically. Okay, <laughs> it's really it's it's really weird, but it ties into like James Shelby Downard the gold certificates, like a bunch of weird stuff that we were already researching and people specifically that we were researching um, uh, involves a group called the Sovereign Order of St. John, uh, which is a super esoteric thing that I'd never heard of. Um, And then uh, Steven Snyder kind of showed us, look, you know, these guys are a part of a lot of the stuff. You know, uh, Peter Lavenda, um, the um, Sinister Forces series. Have you read that? Before. Well, I haven't read those, but I know who Peter is. But, but you know what I'm talking yes. about. Uh, you know, his, his whole series um, involves these wandering bishops. You know, and Alan Greenfield is one of these wandering bishops. And, um, and, and so, like, you start digging into this stuff, and it's like, there's a lot of people here disseminating information that's not true, yes. right? Yep. And, and, the fact that so much of it hit on what we were doing. And again, you know, one of the documents mentioned, you know, Steven Snyder, you know, who, who was in the show. And and it was strange, you know, it was like, what's going on here? Why did we receive these after we, and we were finished with pr- production almost, you know, when we got those. And the more that I've dug into it, the more that it has tied into I mean, even Dan Dutton. It's so strange, man. Uh, off the air, I'll t- I can tell you some of this stuff, but but we're still like getting permission to be able to even talk about some of these things. Mm. I th- and I do think we'll have permission for the for, to, to to openly, 
you know, release the documents in the second season. But it's just weird. It's like, I don't know, man. It's just, why do we even need to add that level of com- complexity to, <laughs> to something that's already really strange? You know, I mean, because it connects to Guterma and the mine here and so many weird aspects of the whole story that that it's like, why? You know, why, why, why would we even... Why would someone give this? It's, that's questionable too. The people that gave it to us, you know, then you got to start researching those people. Right. Uh, right. But I, I do think in Hellier that there is a part of that going on. I, you know, regardless of, of what you think of Hellier, you know, in, in the veracity of, of the investigation, the intersection of what they were investigating with Pan and what we were investigating oh, yeah, yeah. and Dan Dutton, that's by, for me, that's the thing. And that, and that was the, you know, the fifth episode was really to try to like stress that, that each, each one of the episodes, hopefully of Penny Royal is layering this so that you see that it's like, here was this. And then you find out this is on top of that. And then this is on top of that. It was like, you know, by the time, you know, Greg came to town, that was just a whole other layer of this. It was like something's happening. I don't know what's happening, but there is this concentration of just unexplainably weird stuff, right? In this one place, and it's like, why is that? Yeah. And and how much does the energy we put into a place then affect the energy? You know, like information wise, what we get back out of it. You know, like, I'm telling you, yeah, I, I'm telling you, man, like toward the end of the working on the first season, I swear I was like, is it? I mean, and then that's the whole like eighth episode, you know, I don't, I don't spoil anything, you know, if it's someone, you know, please listen to the show. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good podcast. <laughs> Thanks, man. Seriously. Thank you. Um, but it, this whole idea was like. Are we somehow because I, I can't remember if we stressed this in in the document in the documentary? You know, ultimately, it's what it is. It's a documentary about us investigating all this stuff, but um, an audio documentary. But when we were looking at Guterma, which I was like, this is this by itself is a podcast. You know, just delving into that guy's life right. and how in the world he ended up in Somerset. You know, because it's like the guy was. Probably an ex-Nazi intelligence agent. I'm almost certainly convinced that he was, based on his past. The fact, I mean, the New York Times refers to the guy as Mr. X. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's just like, this is incredible. And he moves his entire financial empire here to Somerset, to this mine, that everyone's telling us, that these women that you know, and other people, they're saying a cult abducted them and took them to this mine. And I'm like... I don't think there's a cult, but why are these people focused on the mind that right. this dude ends up owning, right? And and so, like, we research Guterma, and like I said, you know, Darian and I are like, that's what we do. We do a lot of data mining, you know, for, like, the automotive industry. Mm. And, you know, VIN numbers, you know, we, we, like, dive into all this stuff. And when we were looking at Guterma, it was like, all right, we found everything we can possibly find about this guy. And then it was like that night when Darian messaged me and he was like, dude, you know, Vice President Spiro Agnew was business partners with this attorney at Lester Burns and sold the mine to Guterma. <laughs> and I was like, what? And it was like suddenly we looked at that and there were thousands of articles. And I'm not saying we changed reality, right? But it it felt so so much of this has felt that way that um, that without us and, and I totally hold this to be true in terms of the heart of this story is that that mine which has become such a big part of of this story and of our research you know this Mount Victory mine you know it and I always say I say this a lot. But I think this is totally true and part of what – the heart of what we're talking about is that that mine would have forever been a hole in the ground, right? 
that would have been forgotten to time. But we, for some reason, were driven to research that and to look at that that specific place. And because we've looked at that, it now has taken on a mythical quality and transformed. It'll forever now be this place that has all of this crazy stuff attached to it. <laughs> right. But if we had never looked at it, that would have never happened. Right. But, right. but we specifically, you know, these storytellers, these people with this perspective on the world who are having these experiences had to have observed it in order for, for it to change into what it is now. And I think that is such a large part of everything that we're talking about tonight, you know, um, even in terms of personal phenomena that people experience. But it's like there's this weird element of, of observation and observational reality and feedback. You know, it's like the more we interacted with it, the more we interacted with the story of that place, the more that the story the greater story we were investigating, the more complex it became. Right. The more layers it had. But it was like, it, it's just so strange how that seems to be a feature of, of reality. Yeah. Right? So and, we're, we, we're actually out of time. But let's continue this conversation on the Patreon segment. For sure. And <laughs> I've got uh, something really crazy to tell you too, Ben. All right. Something really. So t- tell people where they can find Penny Royal. All right. So uh, uh, Penny Royal is available on all you know all platforms: Apple, uh, Spotify. I think it looks gorgeous on Spotify uh, with the artwork. But um, every platform uh, that you listen to podcasts, you can listen to it there. Um, with website, the website's uh, pennyrollpodcast.com dot com, and um, and we've been running a, a, a Patreon um, that you can find um, it's patreon.com slash Penny Royal. Um, and we have the Liminal Lodge uh, where we are sharing all of our research. Uh, we've been doing tons of experiments with um, software that Darian has developed, um, like ChannelBot and uh, some data mining software that we used uh, in this investigation that we're still using. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a vibrant community of people that are helping us try to figure out more of this stuff um, and dig deeper into this, the mystery of this area. So and the, um, the definitely limit- if anybody's interested in that, I highly encourage you to you know check it out. And where's so. the Liminal Lodge? It's uh, it's the Patreon.com. Oh, okay. Um, that, that's the Patreon. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it, it's a secret Facebook group. Uh, called the Liminal Lodge. So if you join the Patreon for Penny Royal, um, we give you access to the the gotcha, secret Facebook gotcha. page. All right, everything's on there. So yeah. All right, cool. We'll continue this on Patreon. So uh, thank you for uh, having this conversation with me, dude. Thanks for having me on tonight too. Seriously. <laughs> and I want to take a moment here to send a thank you out to all of my Patreons. It's because of you that this show is possible, and I really mean that. And a special thank you and shout-out to those pledging $10 or more. Super Inframan, Allison Cook, Tim, Nagatha Christie, Patricia W., Barbara Fisher, Will Powell, Big Boy Limina, Craig Parmenter, Walker, Johanna Rojas, Maddie, David Moore, Vincent Trewell, Stone Wilderness, Luke Osborne, Becky Trainer. Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Edu Kamahort, Tactical Therapist, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Taylor, Sam Sharon, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster III, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Dorkamus Prime, Sedgder, Dominic O'Malley, Riker and Stark, J. Otto Bullet. Jose A., Charles Davis, Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Linz Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Matthew Sproul, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Guy Quinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I totally recommend checking out the Penny Royal podcast. It's an excellent listen 
And Nathan stays on, and we do a very long Patreon segment talking about all kinds of stuff related to the podcast and the paranormal, and uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Become a patron at the website, wheretheroadgo.com. You can also find merch there and all kinds of other stuff, uh, including the entire backlog of shows going all the way back to the beginning. I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.